Looking at our world from a theological perspective, this is the Theology Central Podcast, making Theology Central. Good afternoon, everyone. It is Sunday, May the 2nd, 2021. It is currently 3.41 p.m. Central Time. And once again, I am here in front of the microphone. I'm here inside of the sanctuary of Victory Baptist Church. And of course, you know where Victory Baptist Church is located in Ovalo, Texas. It is good to be here this afternoon. We had, um, I, I thought the Sunday school hour went Mm, okay, we, we, I had to spend more time reviewing than I really wanted to, uh, but we continued our discussion about hermeneutics. Uh, if you want to listen to that, go to the VBC podcast, look for the Niagara Creed. I think it's part 26, the Niagara Creed part 26, a very good discussion about hermeneutics. We're getting very close to uh, taking apart the grammatical, her, uh, the grammatical historical method of hermeneutics. So I would really challenge you to listen to that. I think you would, will really appreciate that discussion. If everything works out tonight at 6 p.m., we'll be live under the VBC podcast continuing that discussion. That is the goal if everything works out. So you may want to tune in for that. Then this morning, For our sermon, we were back in Romans chapter 8 looking at the subject of hope, and I think we looked at the subject of hope in a way that may be considered radical, (laughs) extreme, crazy, uh, considering, um, well, when you compare it to the way most Christians handle the subject of hope. So I would really challenge you to go listen to that. I don't always start a, a Theology Central podcast by recommending my own sermons, But that sermon on Romans chapter 8 today, on on basically the subject of hope, that's under the VBC podcast. Please listen to that sermon. I think think you will greatly appreciate it. You may, you may, well, put it this way. You may not appreciate it, but you should find it thought-provoking and extremely challenging. And even though it goes against probably the way you have been taught, I would ask that you would at least consider it and think about it. And of course, if you have any questions in regards to, to anything that I preach or teach, you can always contact t- contact me at newsif at yahoo.com, newsif at yahoo.com, and you can email me anytime. Now, if you're listening to me live this afternoon and you're using the Spreaker app, by all means, hit that little chat icon. You can say hello. You can ask any questions you may have. And we're going to look at another controversial subject in this episode, it seems like I, I I constantly deal with controversial things. Probably my it wouldn't be so controversial if my positions were not so frequently in opposition to the way a lot of Christians think. When it comes to the mainstream evangelical Christian world, I definitely find myself as an outsider. But um, I think I think there should be room for other voices out there who wants to challenge that group think that sometimes you find within American Christianity. And uh, I'm, I'm going to challenge that in this episode. So do you have your thinking caps on? All right, let's start this by going back to the book of Genesis. All right, let's go back to the book of Genesis. All right, Genesis chapter one. Genesis chapter one, verse one, we read these words. Genesis chapter one, verse one. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. And the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. And God said, let there be light, and there was light. And God saw the light, and it was good, and God divided the light from the darkness, and God called the light day, and the darkness he called night, and the evening and the morning were the first day. Now, when you open up the book of Genesis, the first thing, when you, in fact, when you open up your Bible and you start in Genesis chapter one, the first thing you encounter is in the beginning, God. So you start with God and then we see him creating everything. And as soon as you say God created everything, as soon as you say God created or use the word creation, or creationism, well, you immediately know you find yourself in direct conflict 
with a world that holds to a materialistic origin of everything. Like, we believe in the beginning God, and then God speaks everything into existence, and on the other side, you have the materialistic idea that basically in the beginning was matter, and then basically matter exploded, and then over time, life evolved, right? You have kind of a materialistic understanding of the universe, right? So in the beginning, God created, or basically in the beginning, matter. And you real immediately realize when you start reading your Bible that, wait a minute, that's in direct conflict with the academic scientific world, right? And not only does it say in the beginning God created, then it talks about the evening and the morning being the first day, then the evening and the morning being the second day, and the evening and the morning being the third day. So you may draw the conclusion from reading Genesis, well, it appears that God created everything in six days. Immediately, that will get you mocked, that will get you laughed at, and that that will be immediately rejected by anyone in the you know, scientific world who holds to a materialistic origin, an evolutionary origin of everything. And if you, uh, if you continue reading your Bible, you'll come to Exodus chapter 20. Exodus chapter 20, and then you will read these words. Exodus chapter 20, verse 8. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days shall thou labor and do all thy work. Now, nobody has any problem interpreting that. Six days you work, one day you rest, right? I, I think everybody can understand that. That would You would understand that to be what? Six literal days and one literal day you don't, you don't work. On the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord, thy God, in it thou shalt not do any work, thou, nor thy son, nor thy daughter, thy manservant, nor thy maidservant, nor thy cattle, nor thy stranger that is within thy gates. Okay, that's the structure set up here in Exodus that's the law given. We could we could talk about who it's given to, how it's applicable. I that's a whole separate thing. Just understand there's no there's no problem in interpreting what's meant there. Six days you work, one day you, one day you rest. Not six thousand years, not six million years, not six figurative, and you know an allegory. Six literal days. Everyone understands that. And why is that set up? For in six days. This is Exodus chapter 20, verse 11. For in six days, the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and all that is in all that in them is and rested the seventh day. Wherefore, the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. The argument is simple. God worked for six days and rested on the seventh. We work six days and we rest on the seventh. That's the way it is structured. Now, how do you interpret the first six days in that passage? As literal six days. How do you interpret that seventh day? As a literal day. So if you interpret that, then when it speaks of God creating everything from a biblical, grammatical, historical hermeneutic, it's very difficult to say, no, 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 no. It's not telling us that God created everything in six literal days. Well, if it's not telling you that, then the whole argument falls apart. The whole argument falls apart. So from a scriptural standpoint, you seem to have this idea. God created everything. He spoke it into existence, and he did so in six literal days, and he rested on the seventh. That seems to be the basic, clear understanding of the scripture. However, you will immediately notice that that will put you in conflict with the entire scientific world that holds to a materialistic understanding, an evolutionary understanding that everything is billions of years old, etc., etc., etc. I'm not trying to go through every scientific I'm not trying to be perfect in every scientific explanation. I'm just saying clearly you have this materialistic explanation that in the beginning basically always matter. It blew up billions of years. uh, You know, uh, evolutionary process is how ultimately we get people here. That's very contrary to the Bible. Now, that conflict has existed for a very long time. There's no way to get around that. That conflict has existed. And throughout history... There have been those within the Christian world who have tried to find a way to make these two, what appear to be very opposing ideas, somehow work together, right? Somehow let's try to merge them. Let's try to make the, okay, well, okay, the scientific world says it was millions, billions of years. Okay, well, then we don't really need to read Genesis as being a literal six day. We don't, we don't have to really, it, it, no, it doesn't really mean that. And, and that Exodus 20 passage 
you know, he's just saying, look, God, God created everything in a period of time and you work for a period of time. He, he's not trying to draw a, 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 a clear correlation there. So we try to explain it away. That, that literally, you know, don't read Genesis in a very literal way. Just read it that all you need to know about Genesis is that Genesis says God created everything. It doesn't tell you how he did it. So we don't have to explain how he did it. Science can give us the how. Genesis gives us the who. All right. Well, if, if, if Genesis is not trying to give us the how, it spends a lot of time of not trying to give us the how. All right. In fact, Genesis could have simply said in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth and not give us any details on how it occurred. Now, if you believe scripture is inspired, then God inspired the writer of Genesis, which most believe in Mosaic authorship, Moses, to write it exactly that way, which seems to be giving the how. But, but no, no, you can just explain it away. Now, why do you want to explain it away? Because you've got to somehow try to merge these two together. So what we tend to get is this, you've got, you've got the Bible that seems to give us kind of a, a pretty dogmatic claim that God created everything, six literal days, Exodus 20 seems to confirm that interpretation in that re- reading. You've got the scientific world that completely rejects that. And then in the middle, you'll get these people who come along who try to argue for some kind of theistic understanding that, okay, God did it, but he used evolution. He used billions of years. And and the, and the whole reason this group emerges is they're trying to bring some reconciliation. I'm going to make a suggestion suggestion here. We shouldn't try and we shouldn't even bother to try to reconcile the two. We shouldn't even worry about it. I should pick up my Bible and interpret the Bible utilizing proper hermeneutical methods, making the words mean what the words appear to say understanding the words in their context, understanding how other biblical writers understood what happened. Did they understand it as being figurative? Did they understand the creation account not being literal? Or did they say, they, did they believe that God created everything? He spoke it into existence. Did, did Moses in Exodus 20, that's God giving the law, right? That's God speaking the law. Did he not understand that, hey, it wasn't a literal six days, so don't base the work week off of it? Right? Like when you read the text, it, it seems to imply God did it six literal days and that's, that's it. Now, there's a lot of questions it doesn't answer. He created everything with an appearance of age. So does that mess up our ability to, to understand the time? There's so many questions, but you know what? The issue is from a biblical perspective is we just preach what the text says. Now, at the same time, science, guess what? They don't start with scripture. They don't care what scripture says. They reject scripture. So they have to try to interpret what they see and try to interpret things based off what they have at their disposal to make some kind of determination. They don't have a religious text. They don't have a divine source of authority. They just look at, okay, we have this, we have this, we have this, and then they draw their idea and their conclusion. The two, I don't, when everyone comes along and tries to somehow m- interpret them, try to bring them together, I think it just creates all kinds of problems. So there have been Christians who will go, okay, look, science is right when science agrees with the Bible. And if you do science right, it's always going to agree with the Bible. So then they go along and say, well, look, if you look at this, that disproves evolution. If you look at this, that dispro- disproves uh, an old age of the earth. And they try everything to try to make science conform, 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 conform to, I should say, conform to the Bible. Now, sometimes their attempts are very good. Sometimes their attempts, after a little bit of considering this and considering that, are proven to be either fraudulent, misleading, not accurate, not really handling the scientific information correctly, and then that makes us look really foolish. Here's what I would say. The Bible nowhere tells me that I'm supposed to go out there and try to make these two opposing ideas work together. My job as a Christian is take this text and go, this is what the text appears to say. Now, at the same time, I should understand what the scientific world is saying. I should have no problem learning it. I should have no problem understanding their claims because I understand that they are making claims 
completely from a perspective that the Bible isn't true. And basically, in their minds, the Bible doesn't exist. So they're going to always come to a different conclusion than someone starting with the Bible. If you don't start with the Bible, you're rarely going to come to a biblical conclusion. If you start with the Bible, it's amazing you always come to a biblical conclusion. So I got no problem. I, I just think that we spend too much time trying to make these two work. And it, it's created some weird, like, you know, you find sometimes so-called, you know, creation scientists out there making claims. And then you look and kind of go, well, wait a minute, that, that's, that, I don't know if that's accurate. I don't know if that's accurate. And we end up looking foolish. I think it's, I think it's a foolish attempt to try to, to try to make them work. You're trying to take a system that starts without the Bible and trying to demonstrate that your system actually agrees with the Bible. If you redo the science this way, this way, this way, this way, this way. And it, it rarely, like sometimes we make good points and then sometimes we make very questionable uh, issues. I mean, even Answers in Genesis at one time had to put out a DVD of 10 arguments that creation creationists needs to stop using because they were completely not scientific and they were completely fraudulent and not accurate. But yet, yet Christians were running around try, making the claim, trying to demonstrate, no, if you, if you do science according to the Bible, you're going to end up with the right conclusion. But if you have to use fraudulent information to try to arrive at that conclusion, you end up looking like a liar. You know what? There's science. They start without the Bible. They make all of their claims. Okay. All right. You believe the universe is this many years old. You believe it started this way. Okay. I, I've got no problem. Give me all of your studies. I understand it. I'll answer it on the test. You know, I'll pass the science class. Great. However, I believe that the Bible teaches this is how it started. And by faith, I'm going to accept what the Bible says by faith, believing it to be true. Yet I'll listen to what you have to say from a scientific perspective. The two are never going to agree, but I can know both. And in the end, the truth will be revealed. I... I don't, I don't see why that's a problem, but for some, for some Christians, that just makes them nervous. No, I've got to, I got to somehow make that scientific world, you know, bring it into, to agreement with Christianity, but the two are never going to ultimately agree. And I know you can argue, you know, if you just do science according to the, uh, you know, if science will, would, would consider God, science would agree, but it, that's no, it's not, it's never going to work out that way. And again, the attempts at times have been embarrassing, and at times we've looked really, really foolish. Just a thought. Now, I say all of that because there is a new book out. There is a new book out. I've added it to the Theology Central Book Club. I've added it to the Theology Central Book Club. It is called Return of the God Hypothesis, Three Scientific Discoveries That Reveal the Mind Behind the universe. Can we give you the name of the book again? Return of the God Hypothesis, Three Scientific Discoveries That Reveal the Mind Behind the Universe. Now, I have no problem considering what they have to say. I think they're going to definitely approach it from a theistic, a more of a theistic evolutionary kind of concept where, okay, God did it, but it used millions and billions of years and, and it used maybe evolution but again, I believe that's an, an attempt to reconcile. I believe it's an attempt to reconcile, which I think is just a foolish attempt. But the book is out there. Um, it's currently the number one best-selling book on Amazon in creationism. Now, if you listen to the author, he doesn't really like that idea. He would rather be number one in organic evolution uh, genre than in creationism. He doesn't necessarily see himself maybe as a creationist, but... The book is out there. I wanted to bring it to your attention, but I wanted to just start with this kind of idea that I just think trying to reconcile the two, I think it makes everyone feel better. Like you got the person sitting in the pew and they're like, well, wait a minute. In science, I'm learning, you know, billions of years, this, 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 that we started here and then we evolved here and we evolved. And, and, and that is contrary to what I read in the Bible. How, how, what do I do with these two? And I, my argument is you don't do anything. That's science from an ant, from a non-God perspective. They don't have God. So they're going to come to their conclusions. Here's what the Bible says. Know what the Bible says. 
by faith believe what the Bible says, but learn and understand what science says. If there's a way, if there's, a, and at the same time, we question whatever we learn in science, we question it, we challenge it, under, but not to try to bring it into submission to the scriptures. Because you, because trying to bring a, an ideology that begins without God into submission to the scriptures is just impossible. And I think scripture is not designed to give me a complete scientific understanding of the universe. It tells me God did it six days. And that's the, the model set up in, Evel, in Exodus chapter 20 for the work week. It doesn't, it doesn't answer 9 million other questions about this and about that and about why does, uh, why does everything appear to be old and why, why this? It, it, there's a million things it doesn't answer because it's not attempting to answer all of that. So don't try to make it answer all of that. Don't try to pretend we have all of the answers. We don't need all of the answers. You say, but that, that, that bothers me. Well, why? Here's a system, no God. That's the conclusion they came to. Here's the system that starts in the beginning. God starts with God. Here's our answer. Learn both by faith, believe the Bible, but at the same time, don't try to force that system to, into agreement with the scriptures and try to make them somehow agree because it's just never going to work. Now, I say all of that. Now, what we're going to do is listen to a discussion with the author of this book, The Return of the God Hypothesis. It comes from an episode of the White Horse End podcast, which uh, I think it dropped today. And uh, I listened to it early this morning. So let's jump in. Here we go. The story of the return of the God hypothesis is the story of three great discoveries that suggest not just an intelligent designer, but an intelligent designer who has the attributes that Jews and Christians have always ascribed to God. Transcendence, intelligence, and therefore personal, and thirdly, being active in the creation. You see evidence of all three of those things. Thus, classical Judeo-Christian theism provides the best explanation at a worldview level for these major discoveries about biological and cosmological origins. Five centuries ago, in taverns and public houses across Europe, the masses would gather for discussion and debate over the latest ideas sweeping the land. From one such meeting place, a small Cambridge inn called the White Horse, the Reformation came to the English-speaking world. Carrying on the tradition, welcome to the White Horse Inn. Hey there, welcome to another edition of the White Horse Inn. I'm Shane Rosenthal, and joining me for this broadcast is a guest who's been on the show before. Dr. Stephen Meyer received his Ph.D. in the philosophy of science at Cambridge University, a former geophysicist and college professor. He now directs the Discovery Institute's Center for Science and Culture in Seattle. Dr. Meyer is author of the New York Times bestselling book Darwin's Doubt, which we spoke with him about on the last time we had him on the show as well as Signature in the Cell, which was awarded Book of the Year by the London Times Literary Supplement. On this program, we'll be discussing his latest book titled The Return of the God Hypothesis, Three Scientific Discoveries that Reveal the Mind Behind the Universe. Dr. Stephen Meyer, thanks for being my guest once again on the White Horse Inn. It's great to be with you, Shane. So before we dive into the subject of your new book, over the past few years, I've always been a little surprised to see your books more often than not in the religion and spirituality section of a given bookstore, you know, right up there with Joyce Meyer, rather than, say, in the science section. Is that something you've noticed as well? Well, we've had uh, reports from friends on Facebook locating books and bookstores in the religion section or the Christian theology section or something. And some, now we have never endorsed this practice, but apparently some people friendly to us have actually reshelved them in bookstores <laughs> and then taken pictures as a kind of act of defiance uh, and put them in the science section. Fortunately, at, at Amazon, our books, my books, and those of my colleagues like Douglas Axe and Michael Behe are listed in the organic evolution category, as well as science and religion and other appropriate categories. And interestingly, on any given week, you'll see Behe, Axe, Meyer, others at the very top of the organic evolution category. We've been beating our opposite numbers at their own game, if you will. Oh, so good. that's uh, great to hear. That's been kind of fun. So you'll see be he right in there with Dawkins and uh, and Stephen Jay Gould and others. So the bookstores, for some reason, have been very diligent about categorizing our books as religious books. Uh, we don't deny that the theory of intelligent design may have religious implications. In right. fact, my new book is exploring those implications. 
but it is a theory that's based on scientific evidence. Do you find that many reviewers still try to dismiss your work as a form of creationism? Well, I think we're making some headway on, on that issue, although the wiki site I noticed the other day had me listed as a an advocate of the pseudoscientific concept of intelligent design, uh, a form of creationism, blah, blah, blah. For years, they had me listed as an American theologian, though I have, alas, no <laughs> degrees in theology, only things like physics, geology, and the philosophy of biology. But anyway. How would you distinguish your work from creationism? Well, there's two different ways in which we distinguish ourselves from creationists or typical creationism. Creationism usually is associated with the idea that the Earth is very young, between six and 10,000 years, something like that. And the theory of intelligent design is an age-neutral theory, though most of its proponents hold to the ancient age of the universe and uh, planet Earth. And secondly, maybe more importantly, is creationism is based on an interpretation of the book of Genesis, right. the first chapters of Genesis. Stop right here. Now, this is very important. Creationism is based off an interpretation of Genesis. So the issue is, how do I interpret Genesis? Can I interpret Genesis and say, hey, Genesis, when it says in the evening and morning was the first day? No, 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 no. That's not a literal evening and morning. And that's not in, in a literal day. It's not literal. It's it's poetic. It's not literal. Okay. All right. Let's say Genesis 1, not literal. Let's say Genesis 2, not literal. The only thing literal is that, so Genesis 1, 1, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. That's literal. He literally created it. It's literal that he spoke it into existence, but when the text begins to explain how he did it, that's not literal. That's not literal. When it says he he created man in his own image, that's literal. Um, when it gets to Genesis 3 and we have the serpent coming in to tempt Adam and Eve, that's literal. Okay, so wait. So some of it's literal, some of it's not literal. Others will say, no, Genesis 1 is not literal. Genesis 2 is not literal. Genesis 3 is not literal. Genesis 4 is not literal. Genesis 5 is not literal. Genesis 6 is not literal. Genesis 7 is not literal. Genesis 8, Genesis 9, Genesis 10, Genesis 11, Genesis 12. Oh, now we're in the literal. Now we're in literal. Genesis 12, there, that, that's literal historical account of Abram. That's, li well, wait, wait a minute. So part of the book is literal. Part of the book is not literal. Part of the book is simply an allegory with no, no actual bearing on actually how things were done. Th that is the issue. How do you interpret Genesis? So let's make sure we understand this. There is one view of the origin of the universe that is based off an interpretation of Genesis. You are starting with God's word, which as Christians, we believe is the sole source of authority, right? The, the, our only source of authority, scripture alone, that's, our, that's the authority. And scripture says, God did it. This is how he did it. And you interpret it that way and go, that's how we understand the beginning of everything. So that is creationism starts from that. It's starting with scripture. Now, another view is, called intelligent design or theistic. I'm going to call it theistic evolution because intelligent design usually accepts some form of evolution. This theistic idea that there, there, there's, 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 there is a God, God did it, but how he did it, we, the, the Bible doesn't actually say. Look with what they start with. So one starts with scripture. Now I'm going to back this up just a little because I want you to hear this, all right? I want you to hear this. Here we go maybe more importantly, is creationism is based on an interpretation of the book of Genesis, right. the first chapters of Genesis. It's, if you will, a deduction from religious authority or a perceived interpretation of that religious authority, whereas intelligent design is an inference from biological and physical and astronomical cosmological data. So with the creationism starts with the authority of a religious text, Intelligent design starts in an inference from what you get from all of those other things he just listed, from, from, from scientific data. One starts with scientific da data. The other one starts with the religious text. Well, as Christians, I believe the religious text is the inspired word of God. So if I start with the inspired word of God I do, and I b try to interpret it in any meaningful way, 
right? Other than just and not just destroying the whole text. If I try to interpret it with any meaning way, meaningful way, I am going to end up with a system that is contrary to what science is going to say, because science is not starting with that religious text. Now, the minute I acknowledge that the two start from completely different sources, then the two are never going to agree. And I think by trying to say, well, if I start with the religious text, then I can make science work. No, you can't, because if I just start with the text, I can't end up with many of the scientific ideas, right? Because the scientific ideas are are looking at things from a different perspective. There's no way to get true to reconcile the two. There's no way to truly make the two work. One I, I, look, the job of uh, the, the study of scripture is not to try to make me a scientist. The study of scripture is trying to not to give me the understanding of how everything works in the natural world. It is to tell me God created it, tells me what he did in certain areas of creation. And it tells me that creation is by him, for him, for his ultimate glory, that something happened to creation, the fall, Genesis chapter 3, that brought all of creation under a curse, brought human beings uh, to be born as a sinful nature, bringing us under the condemnation of a holy God, and then God sent forth his only son to redeem us. That's, That's what the story is trying to give us, not all scientific understanding. Well, science over there as a course of study doesn't start with scripture because it wouldn't be a, it wouldn't be much of a study. All right, well, we're going to study science just based on what scripture tells us. It's not a scientific textbook. So science is going to give us a, or or scripture is going to give us a biblical understanding of certain things that relate to science, but it's never going to agree or correspond with what you're getting in the scientific world. And if we, and the more we try to bring the two together and try to somehow think that we can make it work, it's never ultimately going to work. And I think it becomes an exercise in futility. And I think it really begins, we begin to waste a lot of our time in that area. I, I really, I, I, I've had a different view in the past. No, 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 no. Science agrees with scripture, but you're never like, and so then you start trying to make all of these scientific arguments and then you find out that, wait a minute. You find yourself getting embarrassed because they're like, wait, that's not an accurate scientific explanation. No, that's not. Ac- look, look at the science. And then you realize, wait a minute, I, this. I, now, now I'm ar- arguing about what, what, how do I understand this scientific concept? How do I understand this scientific concept? And I'm trying to con- make it confer- conform to scripture. And it just, it just sometimes become a meaningless exercise in futility when what I need to do is like, what does scripture say and proclaim the truth of scripture? At the same time, don't stop the the study of science because it's there and it's offering its view. Just understand it's offering a view that starts without God. It doesn't start with God. Even here, this person who believes in intelligent design is acknowledging you're starting from two very different perspectives. Let me back this up again. I want you to hear this again, all right? I'm going to have you hear this again. Let's see, 422. I'm going to go. I'm going to go all the way back there. Listen, Listen carefully. Take good notes. Listen carefully. Uh, planet Earth. And secondly, maybe more importantly, is creationism is based on an interpretation of the book of Genesis, the first chapters of Genesis. It's, if you will, a deduction from religious authority or a perceived interpretation of that religious authority, whereas intelligent design is an inference from biological and physical and astronomical cosmological data. So the one is a deduction from a religious authority. The other, our theory, is an inference from scientific evidence. So now, why don't you? Start- so stop there. One is a deduction from religious authority, and the other one is inference from uh, scientific data. So one, you're starting with with scientific data and making an inference from that. The other one, you're starting with religious authority. There's no way to reconcile that. There's no way to ever bring those two together in any meaningful way. So why do we attempt to try to do so? Because everyone in the pew wants to feel like, well, I've got to somehow answer all of these scientific claims. Why do you have to answer those scientific claims? They're starting with an inference from scientific data. They're starting with scientific data. You're starting with hermeneutics and and how to uh, interpret uh, the book of Genesis. You're starting with religious authority. They're, st- they're starting with basically the authority of scientific data. So you can't. You're saying, no, here's what the scriptures teach. You may reject it on scientific basis, but here's what the scriptures teach. Here's what the scriptures teach. You may not believe it. You may, and, and I know the fear is, well, if we can't give them an answer, they're going to reject Christianity because of the scientific evidence. 
They may, but my, my, my idea is you just proclaim the truth of scripture and then God has to ultimately uh, bring them to salvation. And just, and, and look, we've tried to debate and debate and debate and debate and debate all of these arguments. And maybe it convinces some people, but I think, I think, um, yeah, I, I just think that in many cases you can convince people of something, but if they continue to look at the scientific evidence, they're going to continue to find one problem after another problem, after another problem, after another problem, after another problem. Or you're going to have to start, you're like, okay, I believe, I believe, I believe, but wait a minute, that doesn't make sense. And so then you have to start trying to change the scripture to basically to to make it conform to the scientific data. And I think that that's, that's problematic. That's problematic. All right, let's let's continue. Start us off by giving our listeners a brief overview of your new book, explaining the three scientific discoveries that you reference in your subtitle. Sure. Maybe I'll talk about the main title first, The Return of the God Hypothesis. Modern science arose in a decidedly Christian or Judeo-Christian milieu in Western Europe in a very particular period of time, roughly between 1500 and 1750, though probably in fairness, the roots of the scientific revolution go back to the late Middle Ages. So what happened during that period of the scientific revolution is that systematic modes of investigating nature empirically arose. And as a result, striking new discoveries were made by scientists such as Johannes Kepler, Robert Boyle, Galileo, Isaac Newton, and many others. This new approach to studying nature was inspired by very specific Christian ideas, like the idea that nature is orderly and that that order reflects a kind of divine governance, thus the metaphor of the laws of nature, the idea that nature is intelligible, that it can be understood because it was made by a rational creator who also endowed us with a rationality that allowed us to understand the rationality, the design, and the order that had been built into nature, and also the idea of design. You you saw this in the metaphor that was often used of the universe as a great clockwork machine, that there was a a design to it that could be perceived and understood and irregularity that resulted from that. So these Christian ideas and Judeo-Christian ideas, some of this came right out of the Hebrew Bible as that was being rediscovered during the period of the Reformation, um, gave rise to modern science. But in the late 19th century, there were a series of discoveries or more theories about origins, uh, the origin of the solar system associated with the work of Laplace, origin of geological features, origin of species with Darwin. And by the end of the 19th century, science could kind of paint a sort of seamless tapestry or a a long narrative of where everything had come from without any need, as Laplace famously put it, without any need of that hypothesis, the God hypothesis. And the story of the book is the story of three great discoveries that are bringing that theistic perspective back. And one is the discovery that the universe had a beginning, a definite beginning in, Mm -hmm. in time and space. The second is the discovery in physics that From the beginning, the universe has been finely tuned to allow for the possibility of life. And the third discovery is the discovery of information at the foundation of life in the DNA and other large macromolecules, and that there have been these large bursts of information in our biosphere making possible new forms of life over time. So what I do in the book is show that those three discoveries taken together suggest not just an intelligent designer, but an intelligent designer who has the attributes that Jews and Christians have always described to God, transcendence, intelligence, and therefore a personal intelligence, a personal creator, and thirdly, being active in the creation. You see evidence of all three of those things. Thus, classical Judeo-Christian theism provides the best explanation at a worldview level for these major discoveries about biological and cosmological origins. So it's the return of the God hypothesis, and you just have argued that it was out of the Judeo-Christian worldview that science arose, but often in popular presentations, we're often told of this warfare between faith and science. Talk about that part of the puzzle. Yeah, absolutely. If you think of the contemporary new atheists, they have had a great run since uh, about 2006 with a series of books. And the message of these new atheist books has been twofold. One, that science properly understood supports a materialistic or atheistic worldview. But second, the idea that science and religion, in particular science and Christian religion, have been at odds from the get-go. And that second claim is very easy to refute. There's hardly an historian of science who accepts that warfare model. That idea was first put forward in the late 19th century by two revisionist historians, 
uh, one named uh, William Draper and another named White, who argued for this warfare concept. And it, this was offered in the immediate wake of the publication of The Origin of Species, but it really is an inaccurate characterization of the history of science. And as I said in the previous answer, you, you can see the evidence for the importance of Judeo-Christian ideas in the metaphors that the early scientists used. They described nature as a lawful realm, thus the metaphor, the laws of nature, governed by a divine sustainer of the universe. Yeah, if you have a law, you need a lawmaker. You had a lawmaker, a lawgiver, and um, this was very explicit in the work of, of Isaac Newton. Um, you had the idea of nature as a clock or a great mechanism that had been designed by a great artificer. Those were the words of Boyle, Robert Boyle. And also the metaphor of nature as a book, that just as God revealed himself through the book of Scripture, he also revealed himself through his works, through the book of nature. So Johannes Kepler, speaking about the intelligibility of the world, said that it was the high calling of the natural philosopher, what people called scientists at the time, to think God's thoughts after him, that yeah. God's thoughts could be read in the mathematical harmony that was evident in the, in the natural world. So this warfare idea has certainly not, is certainly not an accurate characterization of the relationship between science and religious belief, specifically Christian belief, through all time. It certainly wasn't accurate. This was not at all accurate during the period of the scientific revolution and right up to the time of Darwin. And it's, I think, is going to be, again, inaccurate. I think we've had a period of time when materialism or naturalism as a worldview has kind of dominated the interpretation of what science means or the, given us the framework for science. But I think that's shifting again. All right, so much to unpack. Now, I can agree that there was a time in history where theism and science were not at war. I can agree with that, and it would be inaccurate to classify it as always being that way. However, I will argue that it did not take very long for science and scripture, not just the idea that there's a God, not just the idea that there's a designer, not just the idea that there's some intelligence beyond what we can see. No, but scripture, scripture and science, it did not take long for those two to end up against one another, especially in modern times. So let's make sure we understand this. Even if science agrees to a theistic understanding that there was some intelligent design or designer behind everything, and that intelligent designer created everything, guess what? That's still not biblical Christianity. That's still not Genesis. That's still not Exodus 20. That's still not there. That just gets you close. And I think some Christians feel like a little better, like, okay, at least then I can make some argument. See, at least science believes that there is an intelligent designer. Even if you get someone to go, okay, I believe an intelligent designer, then which intelligent designer? Are they going to submit themselves to the revelation of scripture or are they just going to make up their own intelligent designer? What are they going to do? So I think that there's always going to be a conflict between science and scripture. Maybe not some idea of science and an intelligent designer or science and just some generic theistic being, all right, some just some idea of a God, but of Scripture, there's going to be a problem because Scripture seems to indicate that the mind of God will not subject itself or the mind of man will not subject itself to God and his word. It's always at enmity. The mind of man is at enmity with God and it will not submit itself to Scripture because Scripture is beyond just the idea that God created but God created for a purpose, his glory, that, that God then gives more morality. There's so much that goes with the Christian understanding of origin, not just that God created everything. He created it for a purpose. He subjected all of creation to vanity because of the fall. He, he did that and that he's going to ultimately redeem it and that salvation is only found in Jesus Christ and that there is morality that is binding and that there is, there is something called sin. There, there's far more to the biblical account. So even if you can somehow get, say that the war between science and theism may come to an end, that's still a million miles between an agreement between scripture and science. And I think, I think, again, I just, there's no way to reconcile the two in any meaningful way. And I think all of the attempts typically 
I mean, you can try, you can try all day. You can try all day. You can say, oh, no, 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 look, based off this, based off this, see, the age of the earth actually agrees with a biblical understanding. You can try to make that scientific argument all day, and then I can find 50 scientists who will say, that's not true, that's not accurate, that's not true, that's not accurate. And you'll spend your life spinning, spinning your wills trying to make it work. Why try to make it work? This is what the scriptures say. This is what the scriptures teach. I don't have to try to reconcile it. There's no point in trying to reconcile it. My, my, my thing is there is a God. This is what he, uh, he claims. Repent and believe and allow God to do that work. But trying to, to somehow answer every scientific objection, I just, I just think we've tried and we, in, in many cases it ends up, I think it sometimes makes Christianity looks worse because sometimes we use very questionable ways to try to answer the scientific objections. Now here, he's, he's arguing that, these, that there are three scientific discoveries that will argue for an intelligent designer. Okay, that, that's, that's I, and I think by all means, it's great that he did the book. I, I mean, I placed the book as a suggested book in the Theology Central Book Club. By all means, read it. Darwin's Black Box uh, by Michael Behe. By all means, any book Michael Behe has written, read them. I think they're wonderful. I think they're great. I think, and I think the scientific world needs to con- constantly be challenged with their scientific claims and they need to be challenged. I got no problem with that. But ultimately, from a Christian perspective, my job is to interpret the text. And this is what the text says. And it's not going to answer every scientific atheistic objection. It doesn't even attempt to try to answer it. If you think about it, the Bible doesn't even start with trying to explain or defend or prove the existence of God. It just starts in the beginning, God. It it doesn't try to to prove it in any way, shape, or form. All right, let's continue. You say that whereas the popularizers of science generally present materialism as a foregone conclusion and claim that belief in God is a kind of science stopper, the conversations you actually heard within the walls of the academy were less dismissive of theistic considerations. Talk about that. Well, right. I, I had on many occasions, um, when, when they learned I was working on the origin of life problem, my PhD at Cambridge was on origin of life biology. And when they found out I was working on the origin of life, oftentimes, A, they were intrigued, but then B, they pull me aside for private conversation and say things like, you know, those theories never have made any sense to me. Hmm. That life is way too complicated to have arisen by a series of undirected chemical reactions. Um, that just isn't, isn't going to happen. On another occasion, Sir Fred Hoyle came to give a talk at the university, and he was the architect of the steady state theory, which was a big competitor of the Big Bang cosmology in the early days of the 20th century. And by this time, Hoyle had already discovered the multiple fine-tuning parameters that were required to account for the abundance of carbon in the universe and had started to trend in a very theistic direction in his thinking. And after he gave this talk about... um, the problem of the origin of life. I chatted with him a bit. I was just a grad student at the time. He was walking back to one of the college common rooms for a reception. And I told him what I was working on and the idea that the information bearing properties of DNA could be best explained by designing intelligence. And when I said that, he kind of got almost hush-hush and uh, invited me to walk with him. And we had a very spirited conversation where he said, absolutely, there's no question that if, if you could invoke an intelligence, then explaining the key things that you need to explain the origin of life would be much easier. And uh, so he was quite sympathetic to that. And so I found that a number of people quietly were sympathetic to the idea, first, that that evolutionary explanations for the origin of life were at a state of complete impasse. And secondly, that perhaps there was evidence of design in the cell. Yeah. And Fred Hoyle's the one that coined the phrase Big Bang, right? He coined the Big Bang as a pejorative to make fun of the idea that the universe could have come from a singularity or literally nothing. And then, but the term stuck and now it's the, the accepted term for the main cosmological model we have. So now let's jump into the first scientific discovery that you address in your book, uh, namely the idea that the universe is finite, this big bang idea that it had a beginning in time. First, what is the evidence for this? And second, why are you convinced that it points us in the direction of theism? Well, the evidence that first came online in astronomy that suggested that the universe was finite came in the field of observational astronomy. And the first discovery was that the light coming from very distant galaxies was shifted in the red direction of the electromagnetic spectrum. If you shine light through a prism, it will separate into the different colors from red to violet. And the red light corresponds to longer wavelengths. 
So if an object is receding from you, whether it's receding and you hear sound or if it's light, the wavelengths will be stretched out, will be longer and will look longer than they would otherwise look. And then it was realized that the red shifted light must indicate that these galaxies were moving away from us. But then people began to think about, well, if it's expanding in the forward direction of time, if you back extrapolate, if you wind the time sequence backwards, the galaxies would have been getting closer and closer and closer and closer together until finally at some point in the finite past, they would have come from a point near infinite density marking the beginning of the expansion and arguably the beginning of the universe itself. Now, the other thread in this in the 19 teens and 20s that supported this idea, maybe even more powerfully, was Einstein's theory of general relativity, which he first proposed in 1915. Einstein's theory was a theory of gravity that implied that matter or a massive body was literally curving the fabric of space or what he called space-time, because in his physics, space and time were connected. But that implied that if the only force that was at work in the universe was gravity, that the universe should have already undergone a big crunch where all the matter would have curved space so tightly that we exist in a kind of great black hole. But obviously we don't. There's empty space between bodies, which meant that there had to be an outward pushing force, an anti-gravity force that was operating in opposition to gravitation to account for the, for the vast empty space in the universe. And that implied a dynamic universe where something was outwardly pushing. But what Einstein did, because of a dynamic outward pushing universe, implies, again, a beginning, because if you wind the clock backwards, you would have to have a beginning to that expansion. So what Einstein did to circumvent that conclusion was propose that his gravitational force and the outward pushing force called the cosmological constant were in perfect balance, that one was the exact opposite in magnitude of the other, so that the universe could exist in a kind of static state neither expanding nor contracting. Didn't he later regret adding that constant? He absolutely did. As I say in the book, the heavens talk back. <laughs> in 1931, Einstein went out to the Mount Wilson Observatory and met with Hubble. And there's some famous newsreel footage yeah. where Einstein goes in, has a peek through the telescope. And then uh, two weeks later, he has an interview with the New York Times and says that Hubble and Hummus and his colleague there had proven decisively that the universe is not static. And later he said that his fiddling with the cosmological constant to try to maintain the concept of a static universe was the greatest blunder of my scientific career. And so why do you think that that change from the previous conviction in the scientific community of a steady state universe to a sort of big bang theory, why does that lead us into directions of theism? Well, if the universe is eternal and self-existent, if matter, space, time, and energy have always been here, then they can be treated as what philosophers call the prime reality or the ontological basis of all reality, the thing from which everything else comes. And they need no explanation in the same way that theists might posit God as the thing from which everything else comes. Right. But if the universe itself has a beginning a finite time ago, then by the principle of causality, which states that everything that begins to exist must have a cause, then it implies the need for a cause beyond or outside the universe, independent of the universe, separate from the universe. And that raises a possibly theological implication. Now, Stephen Hawking famously argued that it's possible for something to come from nothing, that you can have that start of the finite universe, because as he puts it, if you have something like the law of gravity, basically the universe can create itself. What in your view is wrong with that line of reasoning? Well, there's an awful lot to say about what Hawking proposed. He did this in the 1980s, uh, first in the technical paper, and then in his popular book, A Brief History of Time, which he published in 1988. And the model that Hawking developed was something called quantum cosmology. Now, before I explain what that is, it's really important and interesting to note that Hawking was, in essence, arguing with himself. Because as a grad student, he published a PhD thesis in which he imagined that the universe, at the very beginning, came out of a kind of a black hole state. That is to say, he was aware of the evidence of the expanding universe. He knew Einstein's theory of general relativity implied the more massive or the more dense matter became, the more tightly curved space became. So as he was thinking about the back extrapolation of the astrophysicists, he was aware that, that matter at each finite time in the progressing backwards in time would have been more and more densely compacted, which would have meant a tighter and tighter curvature of space. And he realized that at some point in the finite past, the universe would have reached 
a limiting point where the curvature of space would go to an infinite, where first matter would become infinitely dense, but then at some point, space would become infinitely tightly curved, at which point there would also be no place to put any matter, space, time, or energy. Uh, well, you, you have no space and therefore no time and therefore no energy or matter either. So this is called the singularity. And the physicist Paul Davies has famously pointed out that once you get to the singularity, it becomes impossible. It's an extremity, he said. Beyond that, physical reasoning becomes impossible. Right. You can't explain the origin of the universe from the laws of physics because the laws of physics come into existence with the origin of the universe coming out of the singularity. You can't explain the origin of the universe from a point of zero spatial volume, which is what an infinite curvature corresponds to, because there's no place to put anything, no matter. So there's no matter prior to the universe to explain the origin of the material or physical universe. So why does Stephen Hawking think you can explain the origin when there is no space or time from simply the laws of gravity? Well, the point is that he was aware of the profoundly anti-materialistic implications of his own singularity theorem, which he, he sketched first in his PhD thesis and then proved with one of his PhD examiners, Roger Penrose, and then later working with the great uh, South African physicist, George Ellis. And so these singularity theorems were established in the late 60s and early 70s, and they suggested that the universe had a beginning in time and even a beginning in space, right. that space itself came out of a zero point. And Hawking was troubled by this for scientific reasons, because he would like to have a materialistic explanation for everything, or an explanation by reference to some sort of physical theory. And secondly, for theological reasons, because it implied the existence of a transcendent cause beyond the physical universe, which would really raise that theological question that looked like evidence of a creation event. Yeah. So in the 80s, he formulated this alternative idea known as quantum cosmology. And the basic idea of quantum cosmology is that the, if you do that back extrapolation, the universe at some point would become small enough that quantum physics would become relevant to describing its behavior in particular, the behavior of gravitational forces. The idea is we don't know for sure how gravity would work at that quantum level. And therefore, the back extrapolation that we were extending on the basis of general relativity could not be continued all the way back to the singularity with certainty. You had every indication that things were going back to a beginning, but at the very last smidgen of space and time, you had to say, well, gee, we don't know. And so what Hawking and Hartle did was apply the equations of quantum physics that would have described in rough terms how gravitation might have worked in that early universe. But some problems have arisen with that that I point out in the book, at least problems with quantum cosmology as something that would support scientific materialism. I argue that if quantum cosmology is true, it too has theistic implications. And here's why. Another architect of a quantum cosmological theory, Alexander Vilenkin, pointed out that the universal wave function and the prior equation that solved to generate it are mathematical realities. And this is what Hawking means by the universe coming out of the laws of physics or the right. law, a law of gravity. And Vilenkin pointed out these are mathematical realities, and yet out of them we think that matter, space, time, and energy are arising. Yeah. And he says, but before there's matter, space, time, and energy, what is the template? upon which these laws are written. Yeah, let me read the quote. In absence of space, time, and matter, what tablets could such laws be written upon? The laws are expressed in the form of mathematical equations. If the medium of mathematics is the mind, does this mean that the mind should predate the universe? But you go on to say that he never ended up pursuing that line of reasoning. Well, it was a wonderful rhetorical question, and it shows his philosophical depth and sensitivity. And actually, uh, Hawking raised the very same issue. He said, what puts fire in the equations that gives them a universe to describe? Mm. The laws of physics are written as mathematical equations. Math exists in minds. So these physicists have raised the question, how do we get matter out of math when math is conceptual and math exists in minds? Are we really saying that the universe then arose from a pre-existing mind? Quantum cosmology has been used by Lawrence Krauss and others, Hawking too, to refute the God hypothesis and to support scientific materialism. But I think it actually has philosophically idealist and theistic implications because it implies, again, that matter is coming out of a conceptual realm of ideas rather than from a prior material state. 
one last thing on this is maybe much simpler to understand. The laws of physics do not explain where things came from. In fact, they don't cause things to happen. The laws of physics describe what always happens once we have a physical universe. Right. So uh, it's a category error for Hawking to say that because there is such a thing as the law of gravity, we can explain the universe from nothing. That's not true. The law of gravity, even a quantum law of gravity, will only work once there is a physical universe to describe. It doesn't tell us where the universe came from. Yeah, I was, I was talking with John Lennox about that um, a couple months ago, and he said, you know, the law of mathematics never caused money to be put into my bank account. <laughs> right. You know, it's, it's actually a great insight that C.S. Lewis had years ago in a, in a little essay that both Lennox and I read. And I developed that critique of this idea that laws and causes are the same thing in my PhD thesis. So it's a profound insight that uh, I think we're both, we, we both got from C.S. Lewis first and have both developed in different ways. You know, as I listen to you talk, I imagine. That now, I got to stop right here. Now, this, see, I think this is very important. I don't think you can ever reconcile the two. I stand by that. There's no way. Here's science. It starts with scientific data and then tries to explain everything. Here's the Bible starting with a religious text, and then you interpret it and you end up. When you try to make the two work, they don't work. But here's one thing you can do, and you don't even have to do this from a biblical perspective. This is very important. You can set the Bible aside. You start with the scientific data, and then you critique the scientific conclusions based off the scientific data. And it seems that when just looking at it from a scientific perspective, forget the Bible, don't try to reconcile it with the Bible, you can say, wait a minute, all of your explanations for the origins of everything or the origins of anything, they're not adequate. They don't explain how anything began. You are still with, you still have nothing to explain how we got everything. You don't, you can't explain how everything originated. In every attempt that they've tried, it falls short. That is acceptable. That is okay to say, okay, let's just set aside the Bible. Forget the Bible. Forget anything. Let's just start with your scientific data. Your scientific data does not explain how everything came about. It doesn't make any sense. How does nothing bring about something? How, that doesn't work. It doesn't make sense. How, and you can't use laws to explain how everything began because those laws only work when something is there. Those laws explain how things that are there work. They don't explain and they don't, they don't bring about the very thing that those laws ultimately govern. So you, who, what brought it about? I will argue you can show how science cannot ultimately answer that question. And then you can say, let me present to you an opposing perspective. Now, you're going to have to leave the scientific data. It's called the religious text. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And the evening and the morning was the first day. And the evening and the morning was the second day. And the evening and third day. That, that is the religious answer. Now, that doesn't answer all the scientific questions. It doesn't answer all the scientific problems, but you can't make the two work. You can look at the scientific data and go, okay, I can follow that scientific data, but I get all the way back to the beginning and I have the existence of what? Nothing that brings about something that doesn't make any sense. Okay, so that doesn't work. You can demonstrate the bankruptcy of their position and then say, I'm not going to offer a scientific explanation of how things got here. I'm going to offer a religious explanation. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And I'm going to interpret that religious text the way I would interpret all religious texts using the grammatical historical method and understanding the meaning of words and the context in which they are used. All right. That is, that's not trying to reconcile the two. That's just saying, you don't have an answer. Here's the religious answer. Now, the religious answer is not going to satisfy all of your scientific questions, just like the religious answers don't satisfy all of your philosophical questions. But you can't reconcile, in many cases, the scriptures with philosophy, and you can't necessarily reconcile scripture with science, and nor should we try. I can demonstrate the bankruptcy of your philosophical answers, and I can sometimes demonstrate the bankruptcy of your scientific answers. The scriptures is just a, a, a different, a completely different and foreign answer and perspective on everything from philosophy, psychology, and creation and origin. 
And I think that that's very important. Let, let's finish this up. We've already gone longer than I wanted. Let's try to finish this up. Many in our audience may find parts of this conversation difficult to follow since it deals with so many complicated issues and unfamiliar concepts like uh, quantum cosmology. And I wonder if that's not perhaps one of the ways in which the new cosmologists are actually able to win the argument, since an average person is likely to say, you know, all this is way too complicated for me, but I trust that a brilliant thinker like Stephen Hawking has done all the calculations and has figured it all out. Exactly. I sort of liken it to those movies from the 1950s onward in which some kind of radiation leak is used to explain the attack of a 50-foot woman or of a creature like Godzilla. Since we don't understand the principles of radiation, it works cinematically. Yeah. In the same way, you know, these physicists do their magic. We don't quite understand what they're talking about, so it just works. That's absolutely what's been going on here. There's an old idiom in football, three yards in a cloud of dust, you know, and the math is so difficult in this mathematical modeling of the origin of the universe using quantum cosmology, that most people can't follow the logic of what's going on in the math. Yeah. So they can say, voila, we've explained the origin of the universe from nothing but our laws of physics. Now, the second of the three scientific discoveries you mentioned at the beginning of the program relates to the idea of the fine-tuning of the universe. Can you give our listeners some examples of what you're talking about there and why you think this is a good argument for the God hypothesis? Well, it's an extraordinary development that has occurred in modern physics since the 1950s. And interestingly, it was Hoyle, Sir Fred Hoyle, who first realized the extent of the fine-tuning that was required in particular to produce the abundance of carbon that we have in our universe, which is, as he realized, absolutely essential for life. Carbon has unique properties that allow it to form long chain-like molecules that can contain information. And, um, and therefore provide specificity of instructions for rebuilding living organism. Silicon can't do that, for example. At one point, Hoyle entertained the idea that maybe life had arisen in, from a silicon or in a silicon cloud or something, and then he realized that this was that there were very good reasons that that life was carbon based. And he was trying to explain the abundance of carbon, and in the process of developing a model of stellar nucleosynthesis as to how the carbon would be formed inside stars, he realized that a, there were a whole suite of parameters that had to be set just right. The gravitational force constant, as it's called, um, had to have a very precise range of values and no others. It had to be balanced with the electromagnetic force. There had to be very precise masses associated with elementary particles. The even more fundamental forces at work on the inside of atoms, the strong and weak nuclear forces had to be delicately balanced. And the ratios between these multiple forces had to be just right. And as physicists began to examine the parameters that were required to not just get life or st even stable galaxies, but even to make basic chemistry possible, they realized we lived in the kind of Goldilocks universe where the fundamental forces of physics, the fundamental parameters of physics and the initial arrangement of matter and energy had to be very precise within fine tolerances to allow for stable chemistry or basic chemistry, stable galaxies, and eventually living organisms. And so physicists have often now described the universe as a Goldilocks universe, where the basic forces are not too strong, not too weak. The expansion rate of the universe or the cosmological constant is not pushing too, too hard or too soft, not too fast, not too slow. Um, the masses of quarks are not too heavy, not too light, and on and on. There's several dozens of these parameters, and many of them are exquisitely fine-tuned in a way that requires exponential numbers to capture the, the narrow range in which a life-permitting universe is possible. Yeah, you say that 10 to the 80th power is a number so big that it can be used to represent all the elementary particles in the entire universe. And yet the odds you calculate for various aspects of the fine-tuning represents a number even greater than that. Well, some are less, some are more, but for, yeah, that's a very good reference point. There are 10 to the 65th atoms in our galaxy. There are 10 to the 80th elementary particles in the universe. The cosmological constant, which is, that again, that anti-gravity outward pushing force, has to be finely tuned to about one part in 10 to the 90th is an accepted number among many physicists. To put that in perspective, if you were to attempt to get that cosmological constant right by chance, by blind chance, that would be like looking for one elementary particle blindfolded 
not just in our universe, but in somewhere out there in 10 billion universes our size. Mm. So the degree of fine-tuning is hard to capture with the English language. At one point in your book, you use an illustration borrowed from Sir John Polkinghorne of a universe-creating machine, you know, with hundreds of dials with possible settings. Talk about that. Yeah, the Polkinghorne illustration is great. It's, uh, it's not hundreds, it's probably dozens, on the order of three dozen of these crucial parameters. But some of them are a range of allowable values in a setting within that range. It's just it's exquisitely finely tuned. So you've got the cosmological constant, one part in 10 to the 90th. There's a, something called the initial entropy fine-tuning, which refers to the, the arrangement or configuration of mass energy at the very beginning of the universe. Roger Penrose has calculated the fine-tuning associated with that using a hyper-exponential number. The one chance in 10 to the 10th power raised again to the 123rd power. Wow. Turns out there aren't enough elementary particles in our universe to represent all of the zeros in mm. that number. Wow. Okay, it's just, you can't get your mind around it. So Polkinghorne represents all of these parameters as he asks you to imagine. You know, you're out flying out in space, you come to a, a spaceship that has a big sign on it that says, universe creating machine here. You go inside and sure enough, there's the machine. And it's got all the dials and the knobs for generating the universe. And each one of them is set to very precise settings such that one click this way or that way, or you move the slider this way or that way and run the calculations. And you realize for various reasons, you will not get a life sustaining universe. If even one of those parameters is changed by even a little bit among the, these possible ranges. And he's, that's a way of getting that across. I once interviewed him. And when I first heard him use the visual illustration and talk, he asked the audience, well, what do you make of that? You know, and I asked him, well, what do you make of it? And he, his answer was, well, I don't say the atheists are stupid, but I do say that theism provides a more satisfying explanation. Yeah, yeah. A British understatement, but the point is fine-tuning implies a fine-tuner. And Hoyle himself, interestingly, came to exactly that conclusion. Yeah, this is where he famously says... Uh... A common sense interpretation of the facts suggests that a super intellect has monkeyed with physics as well as with chemistry and biology, and that there are no blind forces worth speaking of out in nature. The numbers one calculates from the facts seem to me to be so overwhelming as to put this conclusion almost beyond question. And he ended up saying that this challenged his own atheism. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, he was a staunch atheist, uh, as evidenced by his opposition to the Big Bang on philosophical grounds. He was quite explicit about that initially. But did you say that he ended up coming to theistic conclusions? Uh, it, it, it was a, a theism of a sort. I mean, he was also entertaining ideas about panspermia, that maybe life had been seeded here on Earth by an intelligent agent, hmm. in part because of the third big discovery in the book, which is that at the foundation of life, there is digital code suggesting perhaps a master programmer for life. But yeah, I think he was leaning in a theistic direction, certainly saw the fine-tuning as evidence of, of a designing mind behind the universe. Well, that's all the time we have for this radio and podcast edition of the program, but you can hear my complete interview with Stephen Meyer by signing up as a White Horse Inn partner. Here's a clip from that extended conversation. One of the things you frequently hear in popular presentations of science versus faith is that faith and science kind of present competing ways of knowing. One of the first things to say about that is everyone has some faith. If we mean by faith, certain axioms or presuppositions that can't be proven. So science itself is based on certain axioms of that sort. It's a number of presuppositions that make science possible. Folks, before we go, please remember that the White Horse Inn is a listener-supported broadcast and that we can't do any of our work without your support. When you sign up as a monthly partner, you'll get longer editions of every episode and will gain access to our 30-year archive. For more information, simply head to whitehorsein.org forward slash podcast partner. That's whitehorsein.org forward slash podcast partner. Also, all right, we'll stop right there. I just want to let you hear some of their commercial because that's one thing White Horse Inn does that bothers me to no end. They're a Christian podcast and you get the 30 minute version for free. But if you want the whole thing, you got to pay some money because they say they can't they can't do their their ministry without money. Um, but yeah, it's interesting that here I sit in the middle of a church in the middle of nowhere, and uh, we don't have to ask for money. Uh, wh how? And I do more than 30 minutes. Yeah, I, 
I don't, yeah, okay. That's a whole different story. But the name of the book is Return of the God Hypothesis, Three Scientific Discoveries That Reveal the Mind Behind the Universe. It was released on March the 30th, 2021. It is now available in the Theology Central Book Club. If you go to theologycentral.net, theologycentral.net, hit the drop down menu, you will now see the Theology Central Book Club. Click on that and you'll have the link that will take you right to the book club. You can sign up. It's free. You don't have to buy any books. We don't get any money, but you'll see the books that we are suggesting, the books that we're like, hey, you may want to read this. And if you want to buy them through Amazon, great. If you don't, by all means, you don't have to. Even if you buy them through Amazon, we do not get one cent. We do not make any money. And anyway, we suggest those books because these are books that I come across that I think, oh, that looks interesting. Let me suggest it. So if you want to get those notifications every time I suggest a book, I've suggested three books in the last probably 15 minutes while we were on the air. Okay, so I was sitting there adding some books. By all means, read that. So let me end with once again trying to clarify my point because I know some people are going to be very confused. I don't think there's any way to reconcile the Bible with science And it claims about the ages of the earth, origins, or anything else. I think the theistic evolutionary kind of approach to try to try to find some, you know, try to reconcile is foolish and it destroys biblical hermeneutics. The Bible's going to lead you with the idea that there is a creator, and it's very hard to have any meaningful interpretation of the Bible without coming to the idea that God created everything in six days. That's the way. Now, what does that mean about the age of the earth? I don't know. I don't have to answer those questions because the text doesn't answer those questions. Here's what the Bible says. Here's the Bible's model of how it all started. Now, with science, I don't have to reconcile the two. But what I can do is then take all of the scientific data and say, wait a minute. You're, you can't answer this. You can't answer this. You can't answer this. And is that answer even really satisfying? I can call into question that and say, wait a minute. I think there's problems with your perspective. How about considering a different perspective? I don't have to say, wait a minute. If I call into the site, if, if I've got to answer all of those scientific questions, I don't have to answer those scientific questions. I can only give what the text in scripture says. If it doesn't offer an answer, it doesn't offer an answer. You say, well, that's not very satisfying. That's the way it works. I proclaim the scriptures. I don't have to try to reconcile the two. I completely reject that idea that I've got to reconcile and I've got to answer. No, what I do is look at the scientific model, learn it, go to school, learn it, learn evolution, learn it all, learn it all, understand it. Christians should understand evolution better than any atheist. We should learn it. We should, we should not be afraid of our kids learning it. Here's this model, right? What is, and then we should critique the model. Well, wait a minute. That doesn't explain how everything began. Wait a minute. That doesn't, ex- wait, the, the fine tuning of the universe. It has to be so fine tuned or we don't even get life. You can't explain that. Wait a minute. At the very basic level of life, there's a genetic code, which is like a digital code. How do you explain that in a materialistic universe? How does that, you can offer those questions and you say, well, I, there's a critique here and I don't think your answer is satisfying. Here's the biblical model. And this is what the Bible says. And, he's, and But there again, there's certain things about the biblical model that's not completely satisfying. But at least I just think trying to trying to find to make the two work together, we sometimes either have to compromise. Now, listen, I think sometimes to try to make the two work together, we either have to compromise the meaning of the text by violating basic hermeneutical rules. That's not acceptable. Or we have to make very suspect scientific claims to try to make science agree with the Bible. And that's not very satisfying, especially if we're proven later that our scientific claims are not very scientific and are fraudulent. That's not satisfying either. All right, I'll stop right there. You can email me all your thoughts by emailing me at newsif at yahoo.com. Thanks for listening. Everyone have a great day. God bless.